I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Q&A. So Tom, I'm sure we have lots of questions. Should we get this going? Absolutely. Yeah, we got some great questions. So I want to thank everybody. And before we get going, I just want to say if you like the show, let us know. The algorithm likes it, and so do we. Uh, you can click the like and subscribe. And if you want to support the show, you can do that. We've got a link in the description to Patreon, and you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. Um, and one other thing I want to say is uh, we get a few people that have, um, you know, sent in questions asking about other channels and other uh, other Bigfoot researchers. And although we may have opinions on those, uh, we tend not to comment on you know other people's works. So, um, and also one last thing: if you send us a question and you haven't heard the answer to your question in one or two episodes, send it again and just say, hey, listen, not sure if you guys addressed this and just send us the uh, a real quick question and we'll get to it. So with that said, uh, we're going to dig in. Okay. Well, this is the first question. This is from Annie and her question is from episode 172. Well, you were talking about sending a photograph to Forrest. It was a picture of footprints from a Type 4 that hunters had taken. And she would like to know whether the footprints were inline or staggered. Will had mentioned that the footprints were human-like. Well, the hunters that found the tracks didn't send pictures of them in line. They sent pictures of the individual footprints. So I don't know if they were in line or staggered. So on a Type 4, do you have an opinion as to whether they would be like Bigfoot tracks or any idea on that? Well, they resemble Bigfoot tracks uh, very closely. But, again, I, you know, on these, um, they didn't, let me see, I think there was, I'm trying to remember if they had anything for reference next to them for size. I don't think they did. I think they just took the pictures. They were out in the middle, in the, in the wilderness hunting in Canada uh, moose hunting and they found these tracks and they sent them to me so there wasn't a whole lot of information and i haven't been able to uh, establish contact with them since so and this happens a lot of people send me things and then i never hear from them again okay all right and we've got a question here it says uh, hey all i have a question about how bigfoot walks it's mentioned a lot that the Mid-tarsal break is in the middle of their foot. So does Bigfoot have two moving joints in the foot? I think I'd have to refer that to Forrest. Well, what happens in primates uh, <clears throat> with the mid-tarsal break, they have uh, those, uh, the, tor the big tarsals that form your ankle. And then you have... Um, um, their, all their phalanges, their... Uh, their their carpal, carpals and their metatarpals and their foot, they're longer, much longer than ours, and they're flexible. And um, <clears throat> they do have more joints and more pieces than we have. And that uh, a mid-torsal break is actually, uh, it, it folds over how it acts is, and I don't know if the people are familiar with it, but it's just like your hand. It will actually allow the foot to fold over like a hand. And if you watch some of these, uh, go out, I always tell people, go out there and watch, uh, you know, some of these primate uh, movies, which is it's easier if you see it than me explaining it. They, they can actually take that foot and fold it over. And you'll see them holding their feet together just like somebody puts their hands together. They will actually put their feet together 
and and sit there with your feet together just like you would do a hand when you, you take your uh, fingers and intertwine them uh, amongst themselves, they will do the same thing with your feet. And that they do have an extra a break there, which, uh, you know, they have extra uh, tor- torsals in that foot. And then that metatarsal acts as a, a mid-torsal break actually allows that foot to fold over so they can use it, it uh, precipitates and aids in climbing. Okay, well, that's very interesting. Now, the same, it, same listener wants to know, they have a couple of other questions, and this is for Forrest. Do apes have the same bones in their foot as humans? Well, I think I, I probably just kind of answered that. They have the same bones. Um, but you would tell, and you could tell an eight foot from a, a human foot in the fact that their bones are much, those they're much longer than ours are. Uh, they're not, ours are shortened. They're, they're heavier <clears throat> in structure because our foot is static and it's designed for walking and running. Uh, their foot is not designed for that. It's designed for climbing. Okay, and I apologize if we've already touched on this, but this is kind of a follow-up. And I think this is more in a conjecture area, but it says when Bigfoot walks, do they push off the ball of the toes and then the mid-tarsal, or do they just, the mid-tarsal break that flexes? Well, you know, I I think that Will probably would be able to answer that more than I would because I've uh, not seen that many footprints of uh, Bigfoot, and y'all have seen quite a few. But the one thing that I have noticed is that it seems, and you correct me on this now, Will, is that it seems like the, and the footprints that I've seen from uh, um, Meldrum and such as that, that it appears that the meta, the tarsals are more forward on, you know, the ankle that I'm referring to is more forward on the foot. And, you know, how ours, ours comes right in at the back of our foot. And there seems to be more forward. So uh, I don't know <clears throat> that forward placement of the ankle on the foot uh Maybe it would uh, produce a more forward placement on the ball than it would be the heel. I mean, you, you help me out here, Will, because you've seen more footprints than I have. It could be because for years back in the 60s and so on, you know, the original people talked about, you know, what appeared to be a double ball impression on the foot. And I'm almost thinking maybe that was weight produced, you know, on the forward part of the foot. Yeah. I would think so, too, because you wouldn't have, uh, you know, you have people talk about being double jointed and there's no such thing as that. It has, that has to do with the muscle, uh, muscle or the muscle stru- structure in uh, the joints and such that produces people giving this image of being double jointed and such. Because there's no such thing as that. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So... This, this is the same, uh, our same audience member. And, and are there differences between the footprints or walking patterns of the various Bigfoot types? Not that we're aware of. They all appear to walk the same way. Okay. And so can you distinguish a type from, from their footprints? No. The one thing I will say, though, is, is it appears sometimes that the younger ones uh, you know, the juveniles that are more, you know, their foot sizes in the human range uh, at times will walk with their toes out, almost like that's how they're getting their balance. But the adults uh, are more in a straight line or their mm-hmm. toes are almost pointed in a little bit when they walk. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Um, on the last show... Will mentioned he often takes a gun when he's researching if he thinks it's necessary. What kind of a rifle do you think is necessary to be able to defend yourself if a life-threatening situation was to arose? Is a thirty out 6 enough? What caliber? Um, 
I know I have my thoughts. What are your thoughts, Will? Well, I haven't actually haven't carried a, any kind of firearm with me for many years when I go to the field, and uh, you know I haven't haven't put myself in a situation like that. So you know I, I'm pretty cautious about thinking out a situation before I go into a place. So it's not really necessary. But what are your thoughts, Tom? Yeah, exactly. I what I typically plan to shoot them with is a 35 millimeter camera or my iPhone or whatever camera I've got ready. Um, but again, it has to do with forward planning and never going alone, uh, going with uh, two or more people, more is better. And um, yeah, th those are my thoughts. So you want to be prepared in that sense. And also, it's not just Bigfoot. Um, it's It just makes sense if you're out in the wilderness you should always have four is better, right? Two is the minimum, but four is the optimal number to go out into the wilderness. Somebody breaks a leg, one person stays with that person, while two other people can go get help. Oh, yeah. And, you know, my approach on that one, it, it goes way back to when we were teenagers doing this stuff. And the reason I, I started out with the number four was because if you have four people, uh, you're able to watch all four directions around you. And but you know there are many other uses like you said if somebody gets hurt you have the the people to help that person and and actually get out of the area so it's it's a good number to work with yeah absolutely and it's not always easy to get uh, you know you got yourself and then find three other people who are willing to and have the time and everything but um, again never go alone okay same person wants to know. I was surprised to hear Forrest mentioned she had a Bigfoot in her house and it threw a can of beans at her. I'd like to hear this story. What did she see? When did it enter the house? And what was the outcome? How did this end? Oh, my. Well, Forrest didn't see anything because Forrest was asleep. Uh, and I think I explained that Back then, I was living in a cabin uh, that I had moved out there and um, because my house had burned down. And um, I didn't see anything. I was actually sleeping. And I still, to this day, I don't know, and I would be a liar if I said I do know because I don't know exactly what transpired, but I do know that I woke up with this horrendous headache and I really I felt like <clears throat> I have been knocked out once before by a horse so I kind of know what that feels like and that's exactly what I felt like I woke up and I at that point in time too let me uh, digress here I was had a bad habit and I think I told you <laughs> about this Will and Tom of sleeping with my earbuds in listening to um shows on my telephone and well, as long as um, one of those shows was creek devil that's fine uh, yeah well <laughs> I, I did listen to creek devil yes and a myriad of other other things too you know <clears throat> um so anyway I, I would fall asleep with my earbuds in and um to be honest with you i it it uh, affected my hearing so i didn't hear a lot of things that i probably should have uh, after this happened, I, I quit going to sleep with my earbuds in. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I, I woke up, and I, I think I used the term I came to because I really felt like I had been knocked out. And I put my hand to my head because my head was really hurting bad, and I didn't know why. And there was ambient light coming in through one of the side windows from the, the pole light outside. And my hand was dark. I thought, what in the world is on my hand? And I could feel something running down my face when I sat up, too. And it was wet, obviously, and I'd wiped my hand in it. And so I reached over and flipped the light on. Well, as soon as I did that, well, then I saw the blood. And here I'm sitting with my feet on the floor, and I happen to look forward, and I see the door to the cabin wide open. And to be honest with you, 
there was a real musty, uriny smell in the cabin. And um, all my cats had disappeared upstairs into the upper level of the cabin. And it was about that time, at some point during this, I hadn't even stood up yet, that a, a can of beans, of all things, rolled down my pillow. And now, I did not notice until the next day. I picked the can, uh, the can of beans up and set it. And I, and to be honest with you, I didn't put really put two and two together until the next morning about how I had got hit in the head. Because I had, at that point, I had a knot on my head, and I, had, I still have a little scar there on my head from uh, what, where this happened. And I set that can of beans right there on the table next to the bed. And I did not notice until the next day that there was blood on the can of beans. So then I put two and two together. I got hit in the head with that can of beans. And now you have to understand this cabin that I had was like uh, 14 by, I think it's 14 by 20 feet. And my little kitchen net was in there. And uh, I had <clears throat> cabinets, of course. And I will be honest, I don't remember if the cabinet door was open or whether the beans were out on the counter. I don't remember where those beans were. But that cabinet could have been easily opened and something reached in there and just grabbed a can and chunked it at me which is exactly what I kind of think happened. But the, the odd, peculiar thing was that when I sat up, I looked out and the, the door to the cabin was, was open. And I thought, okay, I had a deadbolt on that installed and I had, because it didn't come with one and I just felt like I should put a deadbolt on the, uh, and I had it installed. And what had happened was, the deadbolt and the door had been literally pushed open and the wood where the deadbolt, you know, goes into the, the door facing there was completely torn out. And it appeared that something had just given a good push on it and it just gave, that wood gave way. I ended up having to get, uh, they had to put, you know, wood, facing on there and fix repair that and actually drill out a new hole and put uh, a new deadbolt in there for me uh, to secure it. But that night, I mean, I, I was scared that night. I'm not going to lie to you. I was. And I actually piled a bunch of stuff up in front of the door like a silly fool, um, not really realizing what it was. But it, this was like a month after I had had the original sighting at the window. And I will, and I think y'all have asked me before whether I thought it, I, I don't think it was the big one that came in there. That one that I saw that night at the window, shaking the air conditioner. I don't think it could have, it would have, it would have had difficulty getting through that, navigating through that door. I think it was a younger one. And I don't know whether it was meanness, mischief or what that caused it to do what it did, but that's what it did. And it caught me good in the head. And I haven't forgotten it. And uh, uh, and like I say, I still have a, a, a score, about a half-inch score in the middle of my forehead that I bear for that. Forrest, now I've, I've, I've never been knocked completely unconscious, but I've had concussions, a couple of them in my lifetime. What was it that, uh, and I know what it feels like after for me anyway i had a pretty serious one one time and you know it took a few days for the brain to kind of get back to normal uh, if it ever did <laughs> but but um you said you what what did you feel tell us about well, you know you thought it was a concussion how did you what made you think that well i don't think i actually used the concussion the term concussion but i said i felt like i was knocked out yeah, and, that's right. Uh, yeah. And I had been knocked out once before, believe it or not, by a horse's jaw. Horse swung around, caught me just right in the head and just knocked me clean, clean out. And um, I, I didn't go to the hospital for a concussion or anything. Uh, and actually, I didn't. Uh, I had some bruising on the side of my head, but that was the extent of it. And 
But this was actually, in some respects, made me feel worse. It was right in the center of my forehead. I had a, a great big knot, in fact, that swelled up on my head, and I went to work. <laughs> um, I think this happened on a Wednesday night, if I remember correctly. And at that point in time, I was not I was off on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And, and when I returned to work on Friday, I just know that when I returned back to work, everybody was teasing me about what, uh, you know, who did I get into a fight with? Because I had this black knot on my forehead and it was there. I mean, and it was probably a good week and a half before the, the bruising actually started to go away. But you get that. I mean, you. I was foggy for two or three days, and um, and when I say foggy, I mean, you know, you just can't really uh, think real clearly. You just don't feel real good, and I felt real dizzy and swimmy-headed after it. So um, I probably should have gone to the doctor. I probably should have gone to the ER the next day at least and had them check it out, but I did not do that. I mean, what the hell was I going to tell them? that I think a damn Bigfoot knocked me in the head with a can of beans. Then they What else would you tell them? The, the guys would have been coming over there with the, <laughs> the, the straight jackets. This lady needs to go to the uh, <laughs> psych ward. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I guess I could have made up some, some lame excuse, but uh, I, that was basically the extent of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, it that is. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh no, oh no, and wondering what the disposition or the motive for a Bigfoot, you know, well, that, beating you in the head with a can of beans. Yeah, well, you know, uh, you and I talked about it, and I mean, now we can laugh about it. You know, back then, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's been five years ago now, and and I mean. Uh, I mean, it wasn't so funny then, but now I can laugh about it. But, you know, even still, it's not a funny situation because uh, the next, how do I know that I don't walk out the door here and somebody clocked me in the head with a, a big rock, you know? Um, I don't know. You, you, Forrest, I that's mean, a I'm really not a big, big psychologist. <laughs> no, but that's a good point because for reasons that we're not going to get in depth on on the show... You know, we do know that they throw rocks at people. They throw things at people. They throw logs, rocks, right, Tom. and sometimes they connect. One of the things that I made me think immediately of was Carol's situation in Missouri. You know, with people being knocked out with rocks there on the side of their heads. Exactly. Yes. And some people, I think it it goes a step further. Well. Yeah, I think we both know what you're talking about. And, uh, you know, I have talked and said this before on the show about, uh, you know, primates cannot, like your great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, um, cannot control. They have the fast twitch, slow twitch. Uh, they, They cannot control the power of their swings like we can because their muscles are fast twitch designed. Uh, ours are not that way. So we can control the motion of our upper arms. And when we deliver a blow, chimpanzees cannot do that. When you're getting uh, a force, and I always say that I, uh, I associate Bigfoot behavior with chimpanzee behavior, not there. Yes, there are some traits like gorillas, but I really associate their aggressive behavior with that of which I've seen in chimpanzees. And chimpanzees, when they swing, you're getting the full force of their swing. They cannot. Is that every time? Is, huh? When they throw, is that every time when they throw something or hit you or whatever? Yeah. Because they have a slow, the how do slow twitch, fast, fast twitch, twitch muscle, fast twitch, fast, fast twitch. twitch. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're getting the full force every single time yep okay yeah that's why you don't you don't want to get them mad and then have them start swinging and 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 uh uh i mean you you'll even see in chimpanzee uh uh, uh troops 
I mean, everybody, if you got some, some male that's, or even females every once in a while will act out like that, but mostly it's the males. When they start swinging their arms around and grabbing trees and breaking limbs and stuff, and they start swinging those limbs and stuff, everybody scatters. They know what's coming. And they don't even want to be on the end of that. Yeah, I can imagine. Interesting. Well, <laughs> we don't either. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Got a few questions for the Q&A. And number one it says, I've seen Bigfoot shows where investigators claim to be able to call the creatures. They indicate, they also indicate that certain screams howls from far off are Bigfoot calling to each other. So there's really two questions in there. Does Bigfoot do this? Okay, let's take them one at a time. So what, what was the first one? All right, one so the first, the first one is uh, on some Bigfoot shows, investigators <laughs> claim to be able to call the creatures. I know what show they're talking about. And I'm going to say Taurus Ascretia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not really buying that claim. First of all, they're going to know it's not them. And, you know, they just wouldn't. I mean, what what's in it for them to respond to a human making noises like that? What are your thoughts, Forrest? Well, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, Will. I... Um, I don't know of too many people that could exact the call uh, of a Bigfoot. I mean, I have listened to TV shows that um, that people will be out there whooping and screaming and everything else. And I'm sorry, but they don't sound the same as what I've heard on recordings. Uh, try as they may, they just don't sound the same. And I don't think, uh, you know, Bigfoot is an intelligent primate. And they're they are going to be able to distinguish <laughs> that that is not another Bigfoot calling them. Uh, now they they may respond and thinking, oh, we've got some idiot humans out here. Let's go see what they're doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that in that regard, maybe they are calling them up, but it's not for the the they're not responding in the same for the same reason. Let, let me put it that way. <laughs> and I would think those sounds that the, that the creatures emit would have specific meanings for that particular group. So if a human's doing something, um, <clears throat> you know, it just wouldn't fit in with that whole communication factor. Well, exactly. And I, and I think I, I pointed out before that you can, you know, chimpanzees, macaques, even gorillas, the infants make a particular sound when they are calling their mother. They'll be a couple of hoots and then they'll go they'll make a screech after that and then they'll go hoo 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 and then they'll screech i'm not even going to pretend to try to imitate them now they all do the hoots and the screeches but gorilla hoots and screeches don't sound anything like macaque hoots and screeches they are different and you can i can guarantee you that mama macaque aren't going to necess- they're not going to respond to a gorilla hoot who, of course, they're not going to be in the same area anyway, but I'm just saying, you know, one species is not going to respond to the sound that, uh, even though there is a similarity there, they're not going to respond to, uh, you know, one or the other. I, I would think they would be rather suspect of any noises, you know, that humans would make in their environment as, you know, trying to m- imitate sounds that the creatures would make. You know, I think they'd be rather suspect of that and probably steer clear of them. Well, yes, and then of course you've always got Curious Joe that, or Curious George that uh, might decide that he might want to go look and see what you know what's going on, and which in which case that might produce the sightings that we have, you know, around campfires and such as that. When when one of them wanders up uh, to see what the heck's going on, you know, with these humans making all these noises and uh, talking and jabbering and everything else. And I'm sure that's exactly what we appear to be doing to them is jabbering, you know, and uh, they, it's curiosity, I I think, that would bring them up in that case. But, uh, uh, I mean, if you're out there hooting and hollering and everything else, 
the majority of them are going to steer clear. They're going to, no, I don't want any part of this. Yeah, and if it was legitimate, I would think that, you know, there'd be a high percentage of success in doing that, but we're not seeing that. No, no. And I think we, we all watched that not finding Bigfoot, and <laughs> you would see him hooting and screaming and everything else, and uh, I didn't ever see any Bigfoot coming up uh, no. to see what was going on or responding in any fashion. Right, right. Tom, what was the second part of that question? Yeah, second part of the question. We sort of answered it, and we know the answer, and it says, um, do certain screams of howls from far off, are those Bigfoot calling to each other? Does Bigfoot do this? Well, sure, they call to one another, but not in response to yeah. humans making those noises. Right, exactly. So, sad to say, folks, uh, we don't. You can't go into your local sporting goods store and get a Bigfoot call and call these things in, or do it with your own voice. <clears throat> and if you did, you probably wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> the oh, results might not be what you want. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. You might get a can of beans thrown at you. <laughs> yeah, not a good thing. No. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and I've talked to people, witnesses who've encountered these things while they were out, you know, harvesting natural resources in the woods. And it wasn't a can of beans. It was rocks just about about half the size of a soccer ball heaved at them and their dog. So... Yeah, not good. Not good. Um, okay. So, follow up, same person. Do they make screams that resonate, resonate across valley, valleys? I got to get this out here to communicate with each other. And do do they vary these sounds like a language uh, with a descriptive content? In other words, it's like, hey, I'm over here, and yeah, the food's over there, and you know. That's like, what do you think? Well, do you well, think they communicate? There's a couple things going on there. The first thing is for, as far as screaming for distance. Yes, absolutely. I've heard this a number of times out in the in the wilderness areas on the West Coast here. Um, I've heard others respond at times. Other times I think they were just announcing, uh, like that. I've talked numerous times about the scream we heard up in the Olympic Peninsula on the Quinault River. And... That one was just one really loud screech. I don't think it was intended for other creatures, but nothing responded and only did it once. Uh, it kind of upset all the campers in the area. We heard all that noise, <laughs> dogs and everything. But um, um, as far as <clears throat> communicating any kind of message, um, the screams are pretty similar when they do them loud like that, you know, and over distance. So... Uh, I don't know, maybe Forrest could put some insight on her thoughts on this particular type of thing they would do. Well, is he, is he or she uh, asking if they communicate with each other? Is that what he's, uh, is that the way I'm understanding the question is to me? Meaning, um, obviously, you know, primates communicate with each other. Um, and the sounds they make, just like any other sounds, any other animal makes means something to them. Uh, whether it be these these screaming sounds that we've often heard on these recordings uh, from across valleys to the other, you know, other side or, or wherever they're screaming to. Um, I mean, I don't know of anybody that's been able to decipher Bigfoot language, but uh, uh, you know, I'm sure that it has a meaning. Whether it be a male screaming his uh, out his presence to all the the lovely females in the area that here I am girls are uh, whether he's screaming out and letting all the other males know you better stay out of my territory I mean nobody knows what the meaning of the the screams the hoops or anything else is <clears throat> this is why I was thought it was kind of comical again on the not finding Bigfoot is do you you don't have any earthly idea of what these uh, sounds mean and here you are making them in hopes that a Bigfoot will come up. And yet you don't know whether you're making sounds that might be something that might be sexual in nature or might be aggressive in nature. And you might not like what you're going to get when it does come up, if it comes up. So 
um, I think that, yes, that they obviously are means of communication. And the, the thing that people need to understand about primates that, you know, primates are just like humans in one respect. They have a mix. They have vocal cords. They have all the, the necessities for speech. But the one thing they do lack is the neural capacity to create it. If every little primate out there had a human brain in them, we would be talking to them and we wouldn't even be asking these questions because they would already be answering them for us. Um, but they don't have that. And obviously, I don't think Bigfoot does. Now, there's going to be plenty of people that are going to call in and say, oh, that's not true. That's not true because they do have a language. They very well may have a language. But you know what? I can't translate it. Can you, Will? No, and again, it kind of goes back to um, they would have to have a complete society because, you know, from one group to the next, they would all, <laughs> all have to understand all the various parts of speech within that language. And, exactly. and it's, it's just not a likely situation. you got to have syntax and context and all that sort of stuff, and they just don't have that. Exactly. I don't think. Yeah, it's, it's more group-specific like it is with other higher primates. What else well, do we have, Tom? I'm very disappointed. I thought I could go down to my local sporting goods store and get a uh, Bigfoot call. You're going to get hit with a can of beans is what's going to happen. <laughs> if, if I'm lucky, it's only a can of beans. All right. It was surprising to hear it mentioned last show that there are 22 recorded types of Bigfoot. Do you have a list of all these types maybe on your website? I'd like to know how they're categorized. That's a very good question. Well, I, haven't, and I haven't received that information yet. In, in the future, I will. Okay. Well, the the information giver, Chop Chop, needs to uh, get us the information. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to go there. I have to go there in person. Yes, I understand. I understand. All right. Um, okay. Are there any strange types? that are strange even for Bigfoot? Well, we don't know. That's a complete I think unknown. of the... Uh, no, but I do think about Tammy and James where they saw the two different types and one of them looked at the other one with disgust. Well, I don't know if that was strange. I think they just didn't like, didn't like the other one or each other. Yeah, right. I, I always got a kick out of that. They're just like, oh... You, huh? Okay. Um, okay, so are all of these types, are all, all of the, these within the four tub, subtypes that you mentioned before? And I think what he's asking is the 22 recorded types, are they all, do they, would they fall under the four subtypes umbrella? Yes. Yes, they do. Okay. And we don't know. So how does that work? We don't know how Can many of each. Can we elaborate on that? A yeah, we don't know how many of, of variations are within each grouping. At least I don't know that yet. Okay. So if well, we were to. I, yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, you've, got, you've got something that, that probably occurs in them the same as they do uh, other monkeys. That you have hybridization. And uh, I think that this could be producing some of the subtypes that they might be seeing out there, that they may be one, related more to one, one type versus another type, but they've crossbred. And the characteristics don't always come out the same every time they crossbreed. And, 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 and I always fall back on macaques because they are such a, a good example of this because in some of the temple areas, in Cambodia and Vietnam, you get the uh, northern pigtail macaques, which are the, the big, beautiful uh, golden macaques with the, the short um, pigtails. And uh, then you have the long tail macaques, which are the more mousy colored um, macaques with the long tails. Well, they'll interbreed. But that doesn't mean that the produce, produce all the time. They may resemble one species more than the other species. And then you have all these, and, and then the next time they may crossbreed, and you may have then another uh, uh, infant that's produced that may resemble the other uh, type more than the other. So what then you do is have two little groupings 
that are uh, subordinate to the other uh, two primary uh, macaque types. So I think this is what may occur in, and of course it's all supposition on my part, that this may occur in Bigfoot as well. And you may have crossing between uh, your types of uh, Bigfoot up in your areas with maybe something that's more akin to the type that are in, say, in Texas or the southern area, if they have interaction in, in certain areas. And what you end up with is maybe creating subspecies within the species. Yeah, I think, you know, we get a lot of uh, witness reports, a lot of different descriptions and I think aside from variation within the species, we get those factors also. So I think these things account for all this, uh, what people would say are discrepancies. And sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, that didn't look like anything I saw. So that's, they'll discount that encounter. But we have to consider all these different variations. Well, didn't that happen with uh, when you're talking to Bobby? Sure, it did. She gave you a description that was very different than what you'd expected. It did, it did, and I had to think. Well, you know, either either what she saw was not correct, or it was just a different variation. Okay, so here's a question that I think we've had in the past, and I actually have: is <clears throat> we tend to have groupings of like in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to have the bulkier type ones. Mm -hmm. But is there a possibility you could have maybe a type four or one of the other types in the Pacific Northwest or vice versa in other regions? Sure, absolutely. And that does happen. Well, can I, can I ask you this? Have you ever seen any of the, um, you know, the types that uh, we hear about that have the uh, pronounced uh, facial prognathism, you know, like the baboon almost type head? I, I haven't, no, that's... In your um, area? No, not in our area. Well, let me think. Um, I'm trying to think if we had a recent report of that time, do you recall? No, but uh, you guys are going exactly where I wanted to go there, because... There was actually one that I was... I would love out, to see one of those. Yeah, there was one that was outside of the normal area for that type, and I can't remember. I'll have to go back through and see if I can't find that. Well, wasn't was. there a picture of one, what was it, the Seven Shoots area or something? And I'm not even sure if I can remember where that occurred. The one that they said was carrying a white dog that had disappeared from a camping ground. It could be. Remember, and the guy was just taking a picture off of a bridge, and he hadn't even noticed it until he got home and developed the picture and saw that this creature, and it had, you know, it had the, uh, when, I, when I say facial prognathism, that's like a muzzle right. on a, a dog. Uh, that type or a baboon that's called prognathism when the, the face protrudes out like that and all your primates have a certain amount of prognathism we have a flat face and the baboons have a very pronounced facial prognathism and um, and this this thing looked to me when I looked at it almost like a upright walking baboon yeah and <clears throat> and that's typically the feature <laughs> reported with Sasquatches including the ones I've seen have a very flat face kind of like what we do but that particular uh -huh. variation has that very pronounced uh baboon like face it's very different than the other ones yeah i think i think you know i they i think i know the one you're talking about and i think that is that is one of those and it's certainly outside of the normal area where these uh particular variations inhabit but yeah so they i mean they, they do cross into different regions Okay, um, and the last question from this person is, is it correct that the different types can't or don't interbreed? I think we touched on that. Right. Do they fight over territory, or they mainly choose different types of, you know, do they have their own areas, their own habitats, and they just kind of stick to those? Do we, do we have any idea? Do we know? Well, they, they will overlap in their territories, but I'm pretty sure, pretty sure the core areas that they, they don't mix in too much and when they do encounter one another i don't think they fight um there's no indication of that they seem to you know the vocalizations happen and and they sort of you know whatever situation is understood and the groups pass you know uh non-violently past one another into wherever it is they're going and we do have that one encounter that you've talked about 
from, it might have been Lee, somebody heard there was a dispute going across a couple of ravines, mm-hmm. and then finally there was the loud roar that settled it. Yeah, one of the, the dominant shut alpha. Up. Yeah, the dominant alpha made the decision, and everything was quiet. The two groups passed uneventfully. <laughs> I, I love that story. Um, okay, now when they do make a loud vocalization, what do you think the distance? Do you think they could be heard as far as, you know, if the conditions are right, if the terrain is right, 10, maybe 15 miles? I don't know if that far. That's kind of a long way. I'd say, you know, a mile, maybe, maybe two. Okay. And because I was just thinking in terms of like sometimes you get echoes through the canyons and you could even hear like a car horn honking for, you know, three, four, maybe five miles. Yeah, it'd have to be a special situation, but I mean, it'd be the same as, you know, a car horn. Yeah. And how do we know? What do we do? Tell the Bigfoot, I want you to stand here. And when I say go, you're going to yell. Yeah, there's no way of knowing. That's your assignment, Tom. <laughs> Yelling or, or telling it to yell. <laughs> um, okay. With today's high resolution cameras, is a good picture of a footprint as good as a casting. I'm wondering because taking a casting is a lot more difficult and time constraining. Can a footprint now be accurately reproduced from such images? And I've got a thought on that, but I want Will, I want your your opinion. Well go ahead, Tom. I'll uh, I know where you're going. Okay. Well there is equipment where you can do LIDAR. And then you can do, you could actually recreate it the same way, you know, with uh, printers. You know, for example, I had some dental work done a while back, and the dentist actually does a similar thing. They take a kind of like a uh, digital cast of your tooth, and then they tell the printer to go to town, and it builds a new one. And I think you can do the same thing. You can put a LiDAR over a footprint or anything for that matter. And then it will recreate all the di- digital points. As far as would it be a thousand percent as accurate as pouring a caster mold? Don't know. Well, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I think that's probably the best you're going to get. Yeah. No, um, I would say always take photographs and use something for context, you know, if you can measure it. And if you've got the ability, yeah, why not do a casting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a soda can is probably the most recognizable thing. So if you got something like that, put it next to it, you know, if nothing else. Okay. So this person wants to know, does Bigfoot have any predators that they need to be concerned about? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I think they are, they are the right? top dog out there. Yep. And I think everything avoids them. Well, and when you find, you found the remains of a black bear that probably had been killed by one of these things because its snout had been pressed into the back of its skull. And it was untouched. Everything around there was like, you know, it's just not worth it. Yeah, and there are stories of, you know, them um, in proximity with grizzlies. And the grizzlies, will, when they catch wind of them, they take off as fast as they can. Exactly. Yeah, and this, this person says, surely maybe man. Yes, I suppose uh, a man, you know, with a, a bear at 50 might be a problem. But that'd be for one of them, not the rest of them. Right. That yeah. are going to take take that guy down. Yeah, it's the reason you don't want to shoot um, one is because you got to deal with the rest of the group. Yeah, and they they have a uh, short fuse. And they're very temperamental. They're very quick, and, so uh, they lose. don't take kindly. Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Are bears of any threat? We just answered that. No, bears run. They're gone. 
and they're on the menu. Yes, yes, they are. And sad to say that a lot of activity that is probably Bigfoot, bears get blamed for it. And they're victims too. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, here's another question. It says, hi, everyone. I have just a few questions. Okay, given your research and many others researching Bigfoot, do you think any state, local, or federal government agencies have ever investigated this creature? If they have, well, I'm not. They haven't told us about it, have they? Well, I don't. I don't. I don't think there's any organized search going on by anybody in authority. There have been cases like the Skamania County Sheriff back in the late '60s in Southern Washington State. Um, there were, you know, numerous times there were sightings and track finds. And at one point they got a dog with a tracker and went out and they actually followed, followed the line of tracks for about five miles till they lost it. But, um, very few situations like that. I think they're just localized events. You know, I can't imagine tracking one of these things with a dog because tracking is kind of a, I don't want to say laborious, but it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a slow process. It was a lot of work from what I understand. Yeah. Compared to if Bigfoot, especially if he, he, she, it knows it's being followed, gone. Yeah. I don't know. It can just I, take it, off. As far as I know, they weren't that close to it. It was a creature, you know, they found the prints and, and then proceeded to follow him. I'm sure the creature was long gone before they started tracking it. Yeah. And I, okay, this one has oh, to ahead. do with gifting. Oh, go ahead, Will. No, I was just going to say that uh, I, I've known individual law enforcement officers that have, you know, done investigations, but that was on their own time. Right, right. Well, there's the state trooper, one of my favorite stories, Pittenger, right. who <laughs> he he hit pay dirt. He found what he's looking for, and he couldn't get out of there quick well, enough. And even T.W. and the deputy that's a friend of his, you know, situations like that yeah. have occurred periodically, but it's never from the agency they work for. It's it's their own individual uh, pursuits. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this question has to do with gifting. I've seen it mentioned by some researchers, and I've heard that the Indians used to trade items with Bigfoot are you familiar with gifting or trading items to interact with Bigfoot? And, well, have you ever done this? I haven't done it, and I wouldn't do it. Um, I'll tell you something. One of the problems with that, number one, especially people in the South know this, uh, they all say don't do it. It creates a bigger problem than anything. If you stop doing it, then you've got some real problems with the creatures. they they got a short fuse. Um and I refer back to, you know, the whole, the, the alcohol situation we were involved in in 1989 and 90. Um, the one time that somebody did come out there and put some stuff out there against our wishes, it really angered the creatures. So I would not ever recommend doing it. And here's, here's a thought. You're now creating is potential situation where the creatures are associating the gifting with humans and and i'm wondering if they would not necessarily say oh this is just john who's doing this or mary or whoever but they may associate it with humans in general now i will say and then when it doesn't happen right i will say where where jason is he's been leaving some you know apples some you know, just real simple things and the creatures haven't seemed to minded that but um, I think if the circumstances were to change much, that could that could definitely alter that situation. It's kind of a yeah. it's kind of a rare situation that's going on there. Well, if he was to stop, they might go. It huh. could be a problem. He's not bringing us food, but he's here. <laughs> what do you think, Forrest? Well, haven't they actually had incidences where uh, people have been doing that, uh, and then? Uh, I think there was an instance, if I remember the situation correctly, about uh, an elderly woman had actually been leaving fruit and such out for them, like apples and uh, pears and that, out for them. 
and she got put in the hospital. And when she got out, that uh, it had, uh, of course, they, the fruit and the stuff was not there for them to eat. So therefore, they killed her, all of her goats. If I remember that story correctly. Right, right. Let me ask you, do other large primates respond that way if they're being fed, let's say, on a regular basis, and then that's <laughs> taken away? Um, I don't know of any instances where people feed gorillas or chimpanzees out in the wild, but, <clears throat> excuse me, the macaques and the Cambodia and uh, Vietnamese areas where the temples are, and you have tourists coming in, and they have what they call <clears throat> VOs or videographers that come out there now and make a lot of money filming these uh, macaques and they are constantly feeding them and they have actually had problems and had to cull the macaques which I think is horrible uh, they say that they move them to other locations who knows I mean we're dealing with countries that anyway we won't go there um they don't have a real good record for their um, environmental concerns that these animals become aggressive because, and they come up and, uh, and when they don't get food off of tourists, they get aggressive with them. And, uh, but these videographers and uh, what they refer to as VOs are feeding them constantly so that they can keep them around to uh, video them. And so they get used to this and they keep coming in. And then when they don't get it, they get aggressive. They get ag aggressive amongst themselves. They start fighting amongst themselves. And uh, before long, you've got complete mayhem. And, of course, the VOs love that because that makes for good filming. So it's, and, uh, so it's very similar to what... But it's not so good sometimes with a tourist. Yeah, it's very similar to what we hear with Sasquatch activity then when they're being fed and it's taken away. Yeah. You know... Primates all think alike, pretty much. Well, Ourselves included. How would how would a Sasquatch know that? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I just ran out of food. I'm not able to. And are they just going to go? Well, that's okay. I understand. Or are yeah. they going to take it as just, as a slight? They're just going to react to it. Yeah. They're just yeah, just uh, they're going to be mad. It's not there, and they expect it. You know, if it's something that's been coming continually and all of a sudden it stops, well, they're going to be mad about it. And they take their aggression out on whatever is closest at hand. Absolutely. Well, so that's it. Don't do it. We're running a little short of time, so we'll go ahead and wrap here. Uh, I guess we'll pick up the questions uh, that we have next time. Any yeah, and I just want to say real quick, thank, I want to thank everybody for sending in the questions. They keep the topic alive. We love the questions. And you get to answer, you get to ask your quest, questions. We answer them. And there's no such thing as a bad question. Any no final thoughts, guys? No, I don't think so. Tom? I think that's it. Just keep the questions coming. We appreciate it. All right. And uh, we've got some open schedules here. So if anybody's had encounters, you know, be sure to contact us. And um, Tom, you want to give out that information? Yes. Uh, just contact us. Shoot us an email. That's the easiest way. We read those questions at creekdevil.com. Questions is plural. Questions at creekdevil.com. And we'll get you on the show if you're interested. And if you just want an answer, you've had an encounter and you want to know a little bit more about what happened, uh, we can do that as well. And you can contact me directly if you like at either williamjevning at yahoo.com or wjevning at gmail.com. All right, folks, we'll wrap this session up and stay tuned for the Bigfoot history this week. We have, we'll have a different... Uh, uh, story coming up because we finished Ivan Sanderson's book, so we'll have something new coming up this week. All right, folks, that's it for this session. We'll see you next time.
in Bigfoot history. Near Platina, California, winter 1966. Mr. Hampton said at their house, two miles west of Platina, after an absence of two days, he and his wife found 17 to 18 inch tracks with long strides, eight inches deep in the snow. Where they climbed a bank, they were at what appeared to be elbow prints with impressions of hair in them. The door of his house was broken off its hinges. Preliminary description of the external morphology of what appeared to be the fresh corpse of a hitherto unknown form of living hominid. This paper describes, in somewhat general terms, the results of a preliminary inspection of the corpse of what appeared to be some form of large primate of hominid form. The notion that it is a composite manufactured from parts of human corpses and or other animals must, of course, still be considered, since the body has not yet actually been examined. Should it be, the artist who put it together, inserting several million hairs in a skin before it rotted or was preserved, would have to have had some concept to work from, and there is no such extent. This for the following reason. This body is not that of any hominid or pongid, and what is much more significant, it does not conform to any reconstruction or artist's conception of any fossil man or ape or other anthropoid. Its general features and particular characters, as detailed above, display an extraordinary mixture of what have until now been assigned either to men or apes, but it also shows others that have never been assigned or attributed to any of either. However, two separate companies specializing in model making for waxwork museums, exhibits, and film companies in Hollywood, California, have been traced and individual model makers working for both have stated that they made copies with wax or latex and using hair from bears. Mr. Hansen, the caretaker, informed us in January of this year that such a model had been made in April of 1967 because the owner of the original was worried about its safety. An object such as this could possibly be constructed, starting with the skin of a large male pale-skinned chimpanzee using a human skull glove makers, wood racks for the hands, and so forth. The original could have been of this nature, and then a copy or copies made from it. Just in case this might not be the origin of the specimen, we should consider the alternative. Namely, that it is a genuine corpse of a comparatively recently killed specimen, not fossilized in any way, of some form of parahominid. This is the considered opinion of Huvelman's and is based on as thorough an examination as he was able to make, considering that the specimen is encased in ice that is more than half opaque and sunk about two feet below the glass cover of its container. And, if this is the correct interpretation, we would opine that it would more probably be on the hominid rather than the pongid stem of anthropoid evolution. Just where it should be placed on that stem cannot, of course, be said, until it has been properly examined out of its ice envelopment. Further, and much more important, will be any analysis of its blood, plasma, and other body fluids, if they are still sufficiently preserved for typing. Even then, we may well be confounded because this specimen displays such a combination of characters attributed to the two presently thought quite widely separated families of anthropoid primates. And this constrains us to add a note of added caution. In view of the fact that pongids and hominids have now been shown to fall into several groups, together, Vidi, the Caucasoid and Congoid hominids, with the gorillas and chimpanzees on the one hand, and the Mias, Siamangs, and Gibbons among the pongids with the Mongoloid hominids on the other, is it not possible that not only the hominids, but the pongids have a grid-like genetic origin? If this be the case, could the concept not be further extended to include all the anthropoids, so that there may have been, and in this case may still be truly, man-like apes and ape-like men? This specimen is by several criteria a hominid, noticeably by its feet, but it has many pongid characters. Are the diagnostic features we are currently employing to separate the apes from men valid? 
If not, are both our families invalid, and could both groups form but one complex? If so, we will have to add the hairy man to Desmond Morris's naked ape. Anything of this nature will absolutely demand an overall revision of our ideas of both physical and social anthropology, and will present a somewhat alarming problem to scientists and religionists alike. This author's personal opinion as to the precise identity of this specimen is, at the moment, not formulated. As a trained zoologist and one who spent many years collecting mammalian and particularly primate specimens for examination, dissection, and preservation in the field and while fresh, we would not presume to make any definite pronouncement upon anything other than a purely generalized overall description of its external appearance. The corpus must be freed from its ice encasement and properly examined first. However, some speculation as to the taxonomic status of this creature if it finally proves to be real, is perhaps permissible, since we do have detailed measurements and photographs to back it up. It is Huvelman's opinion, which he states categorically in his paper, that this body represents the fresh remains of a Neanderthaloid human. Such hominids are currently classed as a subspecies of Homo sapiens, yet Huvelman's has named this item Homo pongoids, and thus of full specific rank. Though we suggested that appellation, pongoids, in the first place, we envisaged it either as a subspecific to Homo sapiens, since we have no idea as to the external morphology of the fossil Neanderthaloids, or merely as a possible specific for some other genus of anthropoid. However, this suggestion was purely tentative in that, despite the existence of this specimen, we have no more idea of its anatomy histology, or physiology than we do of the external morphology of the Neanderthalers. I am therefore officially disassociating my name from that given in Huvelman's paper. We are constrained to do this not only because we are personally averse to naming any specimen before it has been physically obtained and properly examined, but also more precisely because we are not convinced that this specimen is Neanderthaloid or even a member of the genus Homo as presently constituted. Further still, it might not even be an anthropoid, but rather a survivor of a line divergent from, and possibly lying between, the hominid and the pongid branches, but derived from a common ancestor to all three. In the absence of the corpus itself, as of the time of writing, and in view of our total lack of knowledge of the external morphology of any anthropoids other than the living hominids and pongids, we consider it to be most incautious to attempt to identify this specimen as of now, and more especially to confine it within a subspecific title. And anent this, one essential feature of this specimen seems to have been overlooked. What can be seen of the conformation of the face, meaning the front of the head, in no way conforms to any known fossil hominid, apart from the juvenile Australopithecoids, and particularly to that of any Neanderthaler of comparable size. There is no prognothicism, virtually no brow ridges. The forehead does not slope acutely. The two teeth that can be seen are infantile. In fact, from what can be assessed of the anatomical structure of the fore part of the skull, this creature is almost as far removed from the standard Neanderthaloid construction as is possible. In these same respects, it shows no more affinity with Homo erectus, Homo habilis, what is known of same, or more especially, such lower types as were once called pithecanthropines, australopithecines, or such like. In fact, if it does prove to be a hominid, by whatever criteria may be decided upon to define that family when and if it is examined, it might well be called Homo pongoids, but it most certainly should not be assigned to the Neanderthal race or complex. Our final conclusion, therefore, is that the specimen we inspected was that of a genuine corpse as opposed to a composite or a construction, and that it is some form of primate. We would categorize it, as of now, as an anthropoid, but whether it is a hominid, a pongid, or a representative of some other previously unsuspected branch of that superfamily, we are not prepared either to say or even to speculate. There are certain firm indications that the specimen examined by Huvelmans and this writer, 
though it has been removed from the place where we saw it, and hidden while a substitute model has been installed, has not been destroyed and may therefore eventually become available for proper scientific examination. Until such time as this is achieved, we advise that it serve only as a pointer to the possible continued existence of at least one kind of fully-haired, ultra-primitive, anthropoid-like primate, and be used only as a lever to pry open the hitherto hidebound notion that any such thing is impossible. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.